Amen, amen. Fantastic. Aren't we blessed by our choir and orchestra? Give them a, one more a round of applause there. <clears throat> Take your Bibles, if you will, and make your way to the uh, book of Jonah, to the book of Jonah. And if you're not sure where Jonah is, it's obviously right behind Obadiah, which is all of our favorite books. And so uh, just start with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Jonah. It's right after some of those, uh, so some of those books. Jonah is one of the great stories in the Bible. And of course, we know the story of Jonah essentially because it's about, uh, it tells the story of this prophet who was swallowed up by a fish, right? And so when we read stories like this, a lot of people who are not uh, uh, believers or who uh, um, see the Bible in a, in a skeptical way would ask questions like, do you really believe things like Jonah? You really believe a, a man was swallowed by a fish? And the answer is, Yes, we really believe the events that take place in this book happened. This is not a, a fairy tale story. This is a, a story of a man who really was swallowed by a fish. But sometimes when we read books like Jonah, we lose sight of the message and the story because of this spectacular, miraculous moment in the life of this man named Jonah. And so this morning, I want you to think of Jonah, but I want you to think of Jonah as, uh, as a mirror. Jonah is one of my favorite stories because when I read it, I see myself in it. When you read it, you will see yourself in it. I believe every person in this room will see themselves in the story of Jonah. And so these events happened. Jesus even spoke of Jonah, and he mentioned Jonah in Luke chapter 11. Here's what Jesus said. He said, when the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. Speaking of Jesus' resurrection. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be for this generation. The queen of the south will rise up at the, at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. And so Jesus mentions Jonah because it's a story that happened. It's a real historical event. And so we really believe the events in this book happened. But what's really important about Jonah is that this is not a story about a fish. The fish is not the star of the story of Jonah. God is. Jesus, in referencing Jonah, he's talking about himself. He's pointing to the message that Jonah bears. Of himself, he says that there's something greater than Jonah here, and he's talking about himself. And so these events happened, and the star of this story is God. Jonah is about the gospel. Jonah is about God and his miraculous gift of salvation. And so we're not going to cover the whole story of Jonah. You've read it in your reading this week, but we're going to look at the first chapter of Jonah, and we're just going to bring about some truths. I actually preached through Jonah um, a, a few years ago, and so I'm going to pull some of the things that I said from our series in Jonah just by way of reminder, because this truly is a, a story that reflects our hearts. And we need to this morning consider our walk with God and where we are, and where our lives intersect with this story of Jonah. And so let's look at Jonah chapter 1, starting in the first verse. It says this, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying. This, this, this first verse is paramount because it speaks to the context of all the things that are happening in Jonah's life. Jonah has heard from God. God has gone to Jonah. And he, he's going to say something to him. And this is very significant because God, when he speaks, we should respond in obedience. 
And here is Jonah. The word of the Lord has come to him, and he begins to speak to him. And, and this is really important because most of us, many of us, if not all of us, at some point in our lives, we've wanted God to speak to us. Some of you guys have ever uttered a phrase similar to this, God, would you just speak to me? Anybody ever uttered a phrase like that, similar to that? God, just, just tell me what to do. Anybody ever ask God, God, just tell me what to do? God, I've got this situation in my life, and I'm not really sure how to handle it. God, would you just tell me what to do? Here in this situation, God is going to specifically tell Jonah what to do. But here's the truth. There's something that we need to never lose sight of. And hopefully this truth will challenge you to think differently about the daily Christian life that we live. The truth is this. God has spoken. And he has spoken right here. We are a people of this book. Christians read the Bible and we read it because we believe God has spoken through it. The writer of Hebrews describes God's word this way. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, for the word of God is living and active. Don't you love that? I mean, consider your relationship with the word of God. It's living, it's active, it's breathing sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, of discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This collection of inspired books is how God speaks to us. It's what God has to say to us. And so when you consider where we are even right now as a church, the changes that we've made, we've made these changes because we believe that. We want to be in God's word, and we believe that if you're in God's word, and if we are in God's word more, God is going to move. And so as a church, what we're doing is we're just reading God's word together, and we're taking a portion of what we read uh, during the week, and we, we talk about it on Sunday morning. So I want to encourage you, if you're not reading with us, to pick it up this week. You can always start right now. Some, at some point this afternoon or today, Sarah Grace will put up our, our, our reading for the week. And you can just read along with us. And then the following Sunday, we'll take a chapter out of what we've read and we'll we'll talk about it. And we'll be challenged from God's word. But we are together in this. Why? Because we believe God has spoken. And we believe the blueprint for the Christian life is found right here. And so here's what that means. That means if, if if you're struggling with life, if life is a little lifey for you and you're trying to find answers, we go to God's word. You need help with your marriage, it's right here. You need help as a parent, it's, it's right here. You're struggling at work and you're trying to figure out how to make some decisions and you, you want to know what to do in this particular situation, well, you go to God's Word. If life has thrown you a curveball and you don't know exactly how to respond, well, you go to God's Word. You got questions about finances and how to handle uh, the, the, the realities of this world, the materialistic possessions that we have and the, the money that whatever it may be, you go to God's word as you walk through this life. And so in Jonah's case, God has spoken and it's, it's, it's really important that we never forget God has spoken to us as well. And so we know that to be true, but what happens next is where most of us find ourselves from time to time. Go to verse 2. God speaks to Jonah, and here's what he says. Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before to me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Here's what God tells Jonah. We just read it. Go to Nineveh. Now, um, the, the Ninevites, these were a brutal group of people. You can read about the Ninevites all through the Old Testament. You can go to 2 Kings, and, and, and this is a, another point in Jonah's life where God had spoken to him, and he says, essentially, go tell Israel to shore up their borders um, uh, to protect itself from the Assyrians. Well, he does that, and Jonah becomes this sort of national hero, if you will. And you can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 14. Protect Israel from the Assyrians. And this was a brutal, brutal group of people. This nation was was out uh, for for nothing but destruction and their own power. Historical recordings uh, describe the brutality 
of the Assyrians. One historian writes this, their king I hung up in front of the gate of his city on a stake. His land, his wife, his sons, his daughters, his property, the treasures of his palace, I carried off all of its people and its goods I took to Assyria. They were known when they would capture a city. They were known for for taking the, the heads of those that would stand against them and make totem poles as a sign to the rest of the world. Don't mess with us. There are some recordings where villages would hear that the Assyrians would come in and they would commit mass suicide just to to, to get ahead of what the inevitable reality would be if the Assyrians were to approach their city gates. So when God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh, what God is telling Jonah to do is to go to the capital city of Assyria. No doubt Jonah already has a relationship with this city. No doubt Jonah already has his mindset on who these people are, that they are a godless, brutal people. He has a history with these people, and God tells him to go to the very people that Jonah obviously hated, that Jonah saw as godless. And he doesn't want him to go and to destroy them. He wants, to, he wants him to go and to preach to them to tell them the story of God. And when you think about this, we know what Jonah does, but when you think about this, there's a truth that we don't often talk about in Christian life. And the truth is this, is that sometimes God is going to ask you to do things that you don't want to do. It's just true. That for many of us, we know God has said something to us. We know that God has told us what to do but we just don't really want to do it. And that's a difficult thing to say, and some of you are going, yeah, that's true, but I would never say that out loud. But it's true. God often asks us to do things we don't want to do. And the reason that exists, the reason we live in that tension is because we have this flesh that wants to do something else. We have this desire, this this thing that we're born with, this nature that we were born with that wants to do something else, and that something else always contradicts God. And so God will come into our life, and we'll get into his word, and we'll start to read things, and that's where the war begins. That's where the battle begins, of flesh and spirit. And there are things that we know that God wants us to do, but we just don't want to do it. And God asks us to do those things all the time. Last October, um, Kate and I were out of town. We were at a conference, and I got a text message from a, another pastor in Arkansas. And this pastor texted me and said, hey, man, we've got we've to do something. Are you reading these reports? And we're a Southern Baptist church, and we're a part of the Southern Baptist Convention. And it was around that time where um, um, uh, the, the Southern Baptist Convention last summer um, voted and the messengers voted to, to establish a task force to investigate the handlings of sexual abuse at our executive committee level. We can talk about that a whole other time. I just lost half the room. <laughs> and so in doing so, a lot of state conventions started to ask themselves the question, well, we should look at our policies and our procedures. And all these stories started to come out of different churches all over the nation. And this, this uh, pastor, who I greatly respect, sent me a text message and said, hey, we need to write something up and we need, to, we need to address this in our own state. And I'm thinking, I don't want to do that. That is the last thing I want to spend my time doing. There's got to be someone else. I mean, I don't know. So I start to pray. I start to have conversations. And as I started to read more stories and I started to think about God's heart for the vulnerable, I had to do it. So I typed up a, a, a motion on my cell phone. I sent it. Uh, we, 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 we went to the floor of the state convention last year. Um, I, I, I presented the motion to our messengers, our Arkansas Baptists that were in attendance, and unanimously it, 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 was, it was voted in yes. We're going to start a task force to ensure the policies and procedures of the Arkansas Baptist State Convention are above reproach. And so it was a big win. We were excited because it was uh, essentially 99.9% affirmative. But we're Baptists. There's always going to be somebody that disagrees, right? We can't find that guy. We don't know where he is now. (laughs) A couple days later, I get a phone call from our president of our state convention who says, Brad, we want you to be the chairman of this task force. I was like, no, you don't. (laughs) Several months later, I am still the chairman of this task force. 
spending time and energy and meetings and reading and having conversations and, and having hard conversations and, and, and reading stories of, of just brokenness. I mean, it's been a journey. It's been a weighty journey because evil is real. But it's the right thing to do. And sometimes God asks us to do these things. And what we tend to do is when God asks us to do something, listen, Jonah is a mirror. We're all in the same boat. You guys are looking at me and judging me. We're all in the same boat. We see ourselves here. When God tells us to do something and it's explicit and, it's, and we know what we need to do, we tend to sort of uh, justify our behavior or we try to find reasons why we can't do what God wants us to do. We try to find reasons when it comes to giving of our finances and being generous people. And we try to find reasons why. Well, I can't really tithe. I can't really give because of this and because of that. And we try to justify. I, there's no possible way I could really love my enemy. This is where Jonah's at. Love your enemy. We try to rationalize our treatment of other people. There's no way I could ever forgive that person because what they did is unforgivable. Now think about that statement. As a Christian, what they did is unforgivable. As believers, nothing is unforgivable. Imagine if God treated you that way. Oh, there's no possible way Brad could, could be saved, I mean, because what he's done is unforgivable. There would be a saved person on the planet, right? I, I know what God wants for me as far as my purity, but, but I just can't wait. We try to justify things in our lives, and we do this all the time. And that's where verses like Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 comes in. There's a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. That we live in this battle between our flesh and our spirit. What, we, what, what our flesh wants to do is to destroy us, and what God wants to do is to give us life. There's an alarming account in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 5, you can read about it in the first uh, a few verses in Acts chapter 5, and it's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira, they have a, a, a bunch of land, and so they decide to sell this land. They sell this land, and now they're going to bring uh, the, the profit, the proceeds of this land, to the disciples. The, the, the church is starting. The New Testament is starting, and uh, the gospel is starting to go out, and so things are happening. People are getting saved. Ananias and Sapphira, you know, again, we're, we're, we're born with this pride in us and this desire to be known, for people to look at us and say, oh, look at how awesome he is. Oh, look how awesome she is. And this is where Ananias and Sapphira find themselves. They sell a piece of land. They bring money to the disciples to, to fund the, the mission of taking the gospel to the world. And what they do is they lie. They, they walk in with this sum of money, and what they tell the disciples and the people here is that this is 100% the profits from the sale of this land. Now, they didn't have to bring 100% of the profits of their land. They didn't have to give all that they, 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 they made on this land, but, but they just decided that they wanted to look great in the eyes of people, to make it look as though they're like the most generous people on the planet. They're keeping nothing for themselves. So they bring it, they lay it at the disciples' feet and say, this is 100%. And the disciples, being filled with the Holy Spirit, call them out. Call them liars. How could you lie? Why would you even lie? No one commanded you to give 100% of the, the profits, but you decided that you would tell people that was the case so that you would look better, so that you would look like generous people, so that people could look at you and go, wow, they're awesome. You know what God does in Acts chapter 5 to Ananias and Sapphira? He kills them. They drop dead right there. And so there is this alarming reality in our lives that we just want to be known. We want to be seen. And we want people to look at us and say how awesome we are. And in doing so, we lose 
because we've abandoned what it means to really walk with God and to walk in truth. And so God's way is a way of life. Your flesh's way is a way of death. And so when I read stories like Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, I'm reminded yet again that God's way and what he says really is the best way. Think about what we've learned together as we've read through God's word at this point. Think about what we've learned from the nation of Israel and their story. Remember how we started this. The nation of Israel is going to be a frustrating group of people because God tells them what to do, and for whatever reason, they find themselves doing the opposite. And what is the result? The result is they get captured. The result is that their lives are are, are in turmoil. The result is that they find themselves on the opposite end of what God really wants them to to do. And so no matter what God says, it's always the best thing to do. We learn this also as we look at the highlights of the nation of Israel. I mean, just think about how it starts in Genesis chapter 22 when God tells Abram to sacrifice his son. Now that is an unthinkable request, but what does Abraham do? He, he does it. He, he goes and he, and, he, and he obeys, and of course God stops him. We read that story. Think about Jericho. Hey, listen, march around the city. We read the story of this amazing battle that takes place, and God gives them a battle plan that's not the battle plan that we would ever come up with. March around the city for several days, and the walls of Jericho will fall. Judges chapter 7, the Gideon, 300 people fight the Midianites. God's way is always the best way. And so sometimes God's going to tell us something to do, and we don't really want to do it. We might question it, but it's always the best way. Jonah hears from God, go to Nineveh, go preach against it. And what does Jonah do? He leaves and goes the complete opposite direction towards Tarshish. Go to Jonah chapter 1, verse 3. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. If you underline or circle, that last sentence is is weighty. He's not just disobeying God. He's trying to get away from the very presence of God. Jonah's asked to go to east to Nineveh, but instead he sets out 2,500 miles to the west to Tarshish. A complete and absolute disregard, total contradiction, and opposite direction of what God is telling him to do. One commentary I read said that it would take about a year for him to sail to where he was going. He's willing to take a year of his life just to get away from the presence of God. And so it's extremely important as we live our lives as believers and as we try to navigate the realities of the Christian life, we should never forget that one, God's way is the best way, and two, there will always be boats going to Tarshish. There will always be in your life this other thing. There will always be this moment where your flesh sort of peeks its head out and says, yeah, yeah, I know God says go that way, but listen, look at that boat. It's better. But remember what this boat is doing. This boat is leaving and running away from the presence of God. And that's what happens when we're tempted with sin. The temptation is to give into our flesh, but the result is to drag you away from the presence of God. And so how do we identify which boat to get in? Well, we are to be a people of the book. God's word reveals to us those boats that are going to Tarsus and those boats that are going to Nineveh. The difference between God's will and your flesh's will is, is fleshes all right? Did I just say fleshes? Fleshes? <laughs> Louisiana public school system. God's word helps us identify those things. And so we have to keep in mind what this boat is actually doing, removing us from the presence of God, trying to get us away, contradict God, and in and, and, and every way possible do the complete opposite of what God wants us to do. And so we're reminded of this truth that every path in life has a predetermined destination. And this is the world that we live in as Christians. The decisions we make will put us on paths that lead us closer to God 
or the decisions we make will put us on paths that lead us far away from God. And this is where Jonah finds himself. Jonah finds himself leaving, running away, giving into his fear and disobeying God. And the lesson that we learn here and the big point of this fish swallowing him up is to remind ourselves that God's way is always the best way. And some of you right now, you're on a boat to Tarshish. Some of you right now, we're, we're, we're drifting away from what we know is right and from what we know is true. And this is what happens in the Christian life. It's never just a, a quick moment. It's, it's, it's usually just a slow drift away. And it's just little by little, little by little. This decision here and this decision here. Uh, um, totally just, just beginning to ignore the disciplines of our faith. The word drift is defined this way. It's a gradual shift in position, an aimless course to become carried along a subject to no guidance or control. That's what happens when we drift away from God. It's aimless. Solomon taught us this as he tried to seek out pleasure in this world, as he he totally gave himself totally over to hedonism. He found it to be pointless. He found it to be aimless. And that drift just happens and happens and happens and happens. There's a story, tradition, there's debatable whether it's true or not, but uh, when uh, the Last Supper, when Da Vinci was painting his Last Supper, he sought out models to, to, to sit and as, you know, to, to, to portray the disciples, and he would paint them. And he found a gentleman, and, and this gentleman uh, was young, and he was handsome. He said, that guy's going to be Jesus. And so he painted Jesus, and he was saving Judas, Judas for last. He was going to paint him last. So he paints Jesus, and then years later, as he's searching to find the perfect person that would depict Judas, so he wanted somebody that, that just looked rough. He wanted somebody that just looked uh, um, just evil, I guess. And so if anybody ever walks up to you and says, hey, will you pose as Judas? Well, they're saying something about your looks. But anyway. He finds this gentleman, he goes, hey, perfect guy. And tradition says, and the story goes, that this gentleman was actually the same man that posed as Jesus. But he had made decisions in his life that changed his physical appearance, that he went from being this picture of Christ to being this picture of the deceiver, Judas. A slow drift away from Jesus. And that's what happens in the Christian life. And what I want to remind you of and what I'm reminding myself of, uh, as, uh, what I'm reminding myself of is to pay attention. To pay attention to whether you're drifting or not. To think about the decisions that you're making right now. And are the decisions that you're making now putting you on a path towards God and his will are the decisions that we're making right now putting us on a boat headed to Tarshish. It's a lesson we try to teach our children. This past weekend we... Last couple of days, we just did a quick trip uh, to Branson, and we did the whole stuff there, and you know, went to Steal Your Do- I mean, uh, Silver Dollar City, and um, we're walking around, and my youngest has got a map of with this, you know, one of those newspaper things they give you. It's got a map, and she wants to she wants to read that as we walk. Katie and Lana are on a ride. I don't ride all the rides because I tend to get sick, so I'm watching my youngest, and I say, Hey, babe. She's not in the room, so I can tell the story. Hey, babe, put that paper down. You're going to run into somebody. She looks at me as if I just said something in Spanish, you know. She keeps walking. Hey, babe, put that up while we're walking because you're going to run into somebody. She, again, looks at me as if she's never heard the English language. Now I'm getting a little frustrated now, and we're five minutes into the park, by the way, and I'm like, oh, great, it's going to be a long day. <laughs> Katie's not here. Well, I didn't see Katie until she just left. I mean, she was gone the whole day. It was sad. <laughs> Joke's on me, right? And so I just walk over to, and at this point, I'm like, all right, Lord Jesus, you're going to have to stop me because this is not going to go good. I say it to her one more time, and she just kind of looks at me again, and this time I just walk over, and I just grab it out of her hand. I ball it up my throat in the trash. True story. And here's what she did. She looks at me with those eyes, 
and then she pretends to have it in her hand, and she opens it. <laughs> and she does this. She's on a boat to Tarshish in that moment. <laughs> Verse 4, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean? What, you sleeper, arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know whose account this evil has come up upon us. So they cast lots and the lots fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to him, I am a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard, these are good men, to get back to the land, and they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood for you. O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, they hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the man feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of a fish three days and three nights. In our disobedience, and this is what God does, in our dis disobedience, God may send a storm of discomfort our way to wake us up. And this is the, the danger of living in disobedience to God. This is God being gracious to Jonah. Because what Jonah needed to do is to do the will of God. Because God knows that the boat going to Tarshish is aimless, it's pointless, it's, it's destruction. It's a path that's leading away from the very presence of God. And so God is gracious to Jonah by disciplining him. And so he sends to Jonah exactly what Jonah needs, a storm of discomfort. And God will do that to his children. And so when we say things like life gets lifey, that lifiness comes from a broken world. Do we just live in a cursed world? It's the nature of, you know, it's what happened when Adam and Eve sinned and this imputed unrighteousness not only impacted our physical lives, but it impacted the world that we live in. The DNA of our planet is broken. And so things happen in this cursed world. But then sometimes the lifiness of life comes from our own decisions and our own choices. And that's what happens when we disobey. Storms start to develop. Disobedience causes storms in our life. Our, our leaving the will of God and giving in to our flesh. If Jonah obeys God, there's no storm 
If Jonah obeys God, he's not in the belly of a fish. I don't know the last time you cleaned a fish, but that is a nasty place to be. And he's there for three days, three nights. But if he obeys, there's no storm. So what is the position of the Christian? What do we do? We seek to obey God at every turn. Because disobedience does cause a storm. But listen, there is always a way to calm the storm. And that way is obedience. That way is to press into Christ. The prodigal son, I was reminded of it. We went and saw the Jesus thing at the Sight and Sound Theater. And one of the portions is, tells the story of the prodigal son. And we know what the scripture teaches us, that this prodigal son leaves his father. He begs for his inheritance, even though his father knows it's probably not the best time to give the inheritance to his young son because he's just going to squander it. But as he continues to beg and plead with him, the father gives in, gives him his inheritance, and he does exactly what the father knew he would do. He squanders his inheritance. And in living in disobedience and giving himself over to his flesh, he finds himself broke. He finds himself poor. He has no more money, and he's given up all of his inheritance, and he's just spent it. Now he finds himself sleeping with pigs, longing to eat the scraps from the pig's food. And then the light bulb clicks. The light bulb turns on, and he says, wait a second. I have a father. I have a home. I have a family. I don't have to live like this this. I will go back to my father and I will beg him to just let me be a servant in his home. Just let me stay in because the, the worst situation in his father's house is a hundred times better than the situation he finds himself in. And so he starts to go to, to his father's house. And we know what the story, we know how the story goes. The father sees the son and he welcomes him home. I, I want to I want to invite you this morning to consider this in your own life. That for some, we're walking in disobedience, and the way to calm the storm is to go to the Father, to live in obedience, to call out that thing in your life that's clear, it's obvious that it's the boat to Tarshish for you to call it out, to repent of it, and run to the Father. And here's the great thing about what the Father does. He opens his arms, and he welcomes him back home. Christians, this morning, the story of Jonah is about a man who disobeyed God, and in his disobedience, God sent a storm his way. And the way to calm that storm is to be obedient. And Jonah was obedient. He goes to the Ninevites, he preaches, and God does a miracle and a work, and, and those people repent, and they start to worship God. And some of you right now, you're on a boat to Tarshish, and it's time for you to get off of it and run to the Father, to repent of your sin, to call out what you know is disobedience, and to leave here today walking in obedience. And so if you're a believer in the room, you're a Christian. Listen, that's the challenge for, for you and for me this morning is to consider our life and to be reminded that God's way is the best way. And those temptations that come our way, they, they, they have one aim and they have one goal, to steal, kill, and destroy. What do you need to repent of this morning? If you're not a follower of Christ, listen, I want to invite you this morning to consider Jesus to consider him as the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus makes this true, this statement, and it's a true statement, and we believe it, that no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. And I would love to share with you what that means this morning, to give your heart and life to Jesus and what you're actually doing when you call out to God for salvation. And some of you this morning, that's the decision that you need to make. You need to put your faith and trust in Jesus and walk out of these doors today living the life that God has called you to live in obedience to him, in a broken world, for the first time in your life knowing what truth is, for the first time in your life seeing the world through the lens that God wants you to see the world through, and that is his truth.
And so if that's you this morning, you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, listen, I'm just a moment, I'm going to pray. We're going to respond by worshiping. Then we're going to, Don's going to come up. He's going to give us some parting words. We're going to be dismissed. And if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, but you want to leave here today, putting your faith and trust in Christ, or at least asking questions about what that means, I would love to talk to you. I'll be hanging around down front when the service is over. You come and you talk to me. I'd love to spend as much time as needed to talk about the most important decision a person will ever make, and that's what they believe about Jesus. You can also fill out that red Connect With Us card. You can place it in one of those black boxes. You write on the back, I need a pastor or minister to call me. We'll call you. But I want to encourage you. You can do that, but I want to ask you not to do that. <laughs> to don't leave here today without doing something about what you believe God is saying to you. If you're a believer in the room, listen, I know that life is difficult and the flesh is real and the temptations are real. And I know that, that, that as, as you, you're sensing that you need to repent and you need to call out this sin in your life, listen, you do that at your seat as we worship. Where, how, come to this altar, whatever it looks like for you. But also know that in doing so, some of us just need more help. We need other people in our lives to walk with us and to help us navigate the inevitability of a broken world. And that's the, the flesh. It's always there. And so if you just need some help, you just need some, some, somebody to talk to, you, wanna, you want someone to just sort of counsel with you, listen, we would love to do that. You take one of those Red Connect With Us cards, you write on the back, you need a pastor or minister to call me, we'll call you and we'll set up a time just to walk with you and, and talk with you. I can't encourage you enough to get into a community group. That's where relationships are built and that's where Christian accountability is developed. We all need someone in our life walking with us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we do love you and we do thank you. And God, I do pray this morning that as we consider the life of Jonah, as we look at his disobedience and the result of it, God, let it be a reminder for us this morning to obey you because it's the best way that our obedience to you is us agreeing that what you have for us is love, that what you've given us is truth and it's a life and it's an abundant life. And those boats that come our way that want to take us from your presence, Lord, they have one aim, and that's to still kill and destroy. And for some of us, we're on that boat. And this morning, God, I pray that you would move us to get off that boat and to go where you would have us go. God, there might be some this morning that never put their faith and trust in you, Lord. I do pray today that they won't leave here without talking to somebody about what it means to follow you. And so, God, our response this morning is to worship to consider our lives, to repent if that is needed, and to put our faith and trust in you if you're calling us to do so. So I pray that your spirit will move amongst this place and that, God, you will move people unto you and that not one person in this room, if their heart is being stirred, they won't ignore that, but they'll listen to your still, quiet voice and it will move them to do something with what your spirit is telling them to do this morning. God, I pray that you would continue to guide us in truth and that we would respond. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing?